So you decided you wanted to upgrade your computing experience. You decided you wanted to add bias lights to the back of your monitor, but you didn't want just any bias lights. You want dynamic bias lights. You want the lights to be able to change color individually based what's on the screen. You want to be able to set it up so that the audio that your computer is producing can change the rate and the color that they're flashing. Maybe you just want to be able to have a static color for your bias lights. You want just green lit up behind or just blue, but you don't want to have to reach behind your monitor every time you want to turn it on or off or change the color. So you got one of those dynamic kits that says you can do all these things and it arrives in the mail and you open it up and there's no instructions. Or maybe there are instructions, but the link that it's sending you to is broken. This guide is designed to replace a previous guide that I made that I was never quite happy with in terms of explaining how to set up these bias lights and how to set everything up so that you can do any of those tasks I just mentioned. Before we get into anything, I do want to talk about setting up your lights. And I highly recommend that when you're using the adhesive and attaching them to the back of your monitor, start somewhere on the bottom of your monitor. So start from the bottom left hand corner or the bottom right hand corner, or if you've got a monitor stand that starts in the middle, you could start to the left or to the right and go either direction. It's going to make configuring it a little bit easier and a little bit simpler for you. But otherwise, get it set up, stick them to the back of your monitor, plug them into the, the actual box, plug the box into a wall outlet and into your USB port, and go to ambibox.ru and download this software. This ambibox.ru website has a program called Ambibox, and you can click this download and install. When you go to install, it's gonna ask you if you want to install an additional piece of software called PlayClaw. PlayClaw is a program that allows Ambibox to monitor what's on the screen. You do not need to install this software. However, it does have an advantage. Some programs, do not allow you to have screen capture software running while it's in full screen. So you may be wanting to watch a movie and have dynamic lights in the background, but it won't work because the software that runs the movie is preventing anything from running on top of it. I'm going to show you how I set it up without PlayClaw. The, the instructions in setting it up with PlayClaw are almost identical, and I'll show you where you can use it. The advantage to PlayClaw is that it is more compatible with more, with more software programs than the way that I set it up. And I'll explain to you when we get there when you need to select PlayClaw and, and I'll kind of explain to you the difference between mine and, and that. So download the software, get it installed, and once you do that, you're going to see a program like this. This is the Ambibox software. I'm running the newest version here, version 2.1.7 you're going to see this splash screen that says donate. The person who made this software did a really good job of making it incredibly customizable for a lot of different hardware. So once you've got this set up and running and you find yourself actually enjoying the bias lights, it's probably worth throwing them a buck to say thank you. But let's move on to the actual program. The first thing you want to do is go to these program settings. There's a couple options here that we can select that'll help us with during the configuration period and set it up so that we can customize the application as a whole. The show hide window key combination is great, especially when you first start using it, because some programs, when you're trying to calibrate your lights, don't like it when you alt tab out of the program to a different program. This allows you, this first checkbox here, allows you to set a hot key that you can press on your keyboard to quickly jump to Ambibox software. In some programs, Alt-Tabbing closes the program from being full screen and you can't go back. Or you can't see what you're trying to configure because it's no longer in full screen. A lot of programs that have that behavior work fine if you use the hotkey option instead. You can always uncheck this once you have everything configured because you may not find yourself needing to go back to the Ambibox program to set things up very often once it's been set up. The next option is blink in taskbar notification area. And since this is Windows 10 and I have a notification bar located on the bottom of my screen, if Ambibox needs my attention, choosing this box will make the icon blink 
so that it tells you that it needs help. Maybe, for example, the USB got disconnected, or maybe something's going on and it can't figure out how to control the lights. It needs me to confirm something. This will blink. I leave it turned off. Generally speaking, I find that you know if something's not working because the lights aren't working. Anyways, no show icon in the taskbar notification area is the third option. And this is actually kind of helpful. The program installs two icons into your tray. Down in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see, I, you'll see a rainbow and then you'll see what looks like one side of a Rubik's cube. Nine little squares, all different colors, coming together to form a larger square. It's two separate programs that need to be running for the software to work, and the menu information they give is nearly identical. However, the one with the rainbow will update with statuses to let you know whether or not something's disconnected or not operating. So for example, if your lights aren't working because it's plugged into the wrong USB port, it'll give you an X on the icon, on the, on the uh, rainbow to let you know that it's not working. You can also right click on the rainbow to quickly switch between profiles. You can't do that with the little Rubik's Cube checkboard thing. So checking this box hides the Rubik's Cube. It's just another program adding clutter, so I'd recommend selecting it. The start program with Windows does exactly what you think it does. It starts the AmbiBox software when you start up Windows. You don't have to do this. You can manually start the program every time you want to use it. This program does use some system resources, and if you're operating on a machine that may be running a little bit slower when this software is running, it might be worth not starting it until you absolutely want to use it. So you can check that on or off based on your preference. Select your preferred language, select whether or not you want it to log errors or any information as the program is running, and then note this last line here. This line allows you to assign in seconds how long there's a delay between when the program starts, well, between when Windows starts and when the program starts. So if you've got software that runs on your computer at boot up, say you have a custom water cooling kit and you want to make sure that your fans and your water cooling are operating before you start additional software, or maybe you've got some other program that launches that it just it conflicts with this program when this program starts to launch, so you want to delay AmbiBox from starting. You can put in a value in this box, and that's how many seconds it's going to wait before it tries to launch the program. I mention that mostly because if for some reason the program doesn't start for five minutes after you've turned on your computer, there's a possibility that you may have accidentally added a value in here and told the program, please wait. So check this if you're seeing delays in start. Let's move over to Intelligent Backlight Display. This is where the meat of the program is located. And notice that at the very top here, it says profiles, additional configuration of zones, automatic profiles, and additional settings. We'll talk about these particular uh, tabs in just a second. This first one with profiles, this is where the configuration and setup of the hardware is. So before we can do anything, we need to tell the computer what USB port it's plugged into, what sort of hardware we're working with, and that we want the hardware to be turned on. So I have mine set up right now to show some information, but you may actually start with your screen looking like this. If that's the case and all this is blank here, click on the more settings option. When you do that, you're gonna have a bunch of stuff pop up, including this device, port, order of colors, and number of zones. The first thing I would recommend you do is set the number of zones. The number of zones should be equal to the number of total lights you have on your strips. So behind your monitor that you've adhesived to your computer screen, count the total number of RGB lights. In my case, I have 131 lights behind my 34 inch monitor. So I've set this value to 131. This is gonna create a zone for every light that I've claimed I have. If I set this number too high, it's gonna create empty zones that can't do anything. And then if I set it too low, it's not gonna try and control any lights beyond the number I set it at. So count the numbers by hand and then put in that value there. The one right above it, order of colors, tells it whether or not it's an RGB strip or an RBG or a BRG or any of these different options. This is one of the great things about this program. 
You can use any strips that you want with this program and then just simply change what the order of the lights are. We'll test this in a second to make sure we've selected the correct one, but the idea is we've, we can change it if we change our strips or if our particular package didn't come with RGB strips, it came with some other different configuration of the order of the colors. Before we can do anything though, in terms of customizing and checking and turning it on, we need to tell the software which device we're using and we need to tell it what port it's on. What USB port is it plugged into? So in my case, I'm using the Adalite box. That's the profile type that I have. And there's a whole bunch of different options that are in the software. I'm gonna pick Adalite because again, like I said, that's the one that I'm using, but you can pick whichever one is appropriate for your hardware. Then we need to pick the port and a couple of things about this. We can click it and my recommendation is just click on COM1 if, and then look right underneath it where it says not connected. My, my lights are not plugged into COM port one. My computer has listed every single USB port including those on hubs and given them a number. Because my lights are not on one, it says not connected. I'm actually going to, after having selected one, use my arrow keys on my keyboard to slowly move through each of the different ports. And voila, look at that. On port four, it now says connected. This is an important point to make right now because if you ever add a USB hub or you unplug it and you plug your, your lights into a different USB port, they're gonna stop working. It's not gonna be operational because it doesn't know where your lights are supposed to be located. So if you move your computer or you have it unplugged and you have to plug something else in or you add a USB hub, you may find yourself in a situation where you need to go back to this particular step and change the port number. Just keep that in mind as you're, as you're using the software and if you ever run into issues. So now, here I am. I've got my device set as Adalite. I've got the port set to COM4, which gives me the connected thing. I've selected the number of zones that that I have equal to the number of RGB lights connected to the back of my monitor. And I've selected the order that I think my strips use. So now that we have all of that set up, I'm gonna go up here to where it says profiles use backlight and I'm gonna turn it on and boom, there's my light. Now a couple things that I wanna do before I go any further is I wanna make sure that the order of colors that I said RGB is actually in fact the colors that I have. So I have it set to static background. If it's not set to static background, you can click this drop down box and pick one of these options, pick the static background option. Then click the color underneath. This color right here that's in the center of the screen is the color you've selected. It should match, at least for the most part, the color you've, that's actually being lit up behind your monitor. In this case, I have blue. If it's not blue, if it's red or green or any other color, that's fine. We wanna test R, G, and B. So I have blue selected. The blue behind my monitor, the wall behind my monitor is light up blue. I'm gonna jump over to red, boom, the wall is now red. I'm gonna to go to green, the wall is now green. So I'm, I'm happy with this. I'm gonna click cancel, come out. Now, just to give you an example of what would have happened if the strip was different, I'm actually gonna have to choose blue, green, red. Now, I have the background color set as blue, and you'll notice that it's kind of an orangey yellow color. Let's see what happens when I pick other colors. So I'm gonna pick red, I'm gonna change it to red. Oh, when I selected red, it was blue. And I'm gonna check green now. The green works, but the red and the blue don't work. So that tells me that most likely my order of colors is wrong and I need to change that. So I'm gonna go back to where I was. Okay, before we go any further, something really important that I wanna tell you about the configuration of this software. Any changes you make in this software is temporary until you hit that save settings option at the bottom. So we're gonna hit that and it's gonna update it and save where we're at right now. Okay, now when you first logged in, you probably had default as your option and it probably wasn't working very well. Or even in fact, you may even still be on default up here at the top. And so you just changed it to static background. The default setting is always there. 
but you're probably not going to want to use the default as your actual default setting. You're going to want to create a bunch of different profiles. And the reason I say you're probably going to want to do that is you may find that for some programs it makes more sense to have it respond to sound than to what's on the screen. Or maybe you want to have it set up so when you use Word or use some other program where it's not really changing a lot, it's not bothering you by having the back color change. So you want to have static for some things, dynamic lighting for others, audio-based lighting for other things. So to, so to set up profiles, what we need to do is we need to go in up to this top bar here, and you'll notice you can actually select the text. We can type in anything that we want here. So I'm going to actually create a new one, and I'm going to call it, I'm going to call it, um, yellow. So I'm going to create this one called yellow, and then I'm going to go down here to add profile, and I'm going to select create by default, but it could you could pick any one. If you choose create based on a different one, it'll use all the same settings that was before, but because you probably don't have anything other than default, I'm going to choose create by default. So I create that, it now says yellow. You'll notice if I click this drop down, yellow is now an option in my list. And then I'm going to go through here and I can change what this particular profile does. So in this case, I'm going to choose, say, static background. I'm going to change, click this green here and I'm going to switch it to yellow and I'm going to hit OK. Now I've set it so that the backlight, backlight is yellow. Now, some of the astute of you may have noticed and gone, in the bottom left-hand corner, it's not yellow. There's kind of an orange tint to it. It's not quite the same color as everything else. And we'll talk about how these strips work in just a second when we get to one of the other tabs, but you're absolutely right. Right now, I've set it to yellow, and the whole thing is not a uniform yellow color. It's a good observation if you saw that. Before we move on though, I just want to talk about some of these other profiles to give you an appreciation for what else you can do here. Because maybe you didn't want it to be yellow. Maybe you wanted it to be dynamic. And by dynamic, you mean that you wanted it to change colors kind of on its own pace. So you say speed of color change. If it goes all the way to the right, it'll shift between colors faster. If you move it all the way to the left, it'll cycle through colors slower. If this is what you want, you want a dynamic background, make sure you go down to save settings. You'll notice we made changes and up on the top of the screen here, it says settings not saved as a reminder that it's not going to remember what we did. Or maybe you don't want dynamic background. Maybe you want the color, the color with your music. So I can change it to color music. I've got these different preset options. I can pull up these parameters if I want to adjust individual LEDs. Um, and then I can change sound level. But the really important part here is the default audio device. I have to actually tell the AmbiBox software which audio channel to be listening for to make changes to the colors based on the sound. So for example, I have speakers built into my monitors and I have speakers connected to my sound card and I have a wireless headset. I could set up different settings and different presets based on each one of those tasks. So maybe I want it to be slightly different on my headphones as I do my desktop. Or maybe when I have my headphones on because they're wireless, I'm not going to be in front of my monitor and I'm, I just want it to be a kind of like a particular profile. It doesn't matter. You have to make sure that you set it to the, the sound output that you want. If you set this up and it doesn't seem to be working, switch between your different sound outputs to make sure that it's not configured to a different one, is my point. All right, plugins lets you set up different colored plugins for this program. I've never used plugins, but if you downloaded and installed a plugin from another website or from somewhere, this is where they would end up being. But the one that I'm sure that most of you are interested in, and the reason why you even clicked on this video, is the screen capture option. This is probably the most difficult one to set up and can confuse a lot of people because the order that you're going to move through this in isn't quite as straightforward as you'd expect. See, there's a lot of different things on the screen here and there's a lot of information that's actually not on the screen yet. And I'll show you what I mean. So 
Remember at the very beginning of this video, I said, when you go to install the Ambivox software, it's going to ask you if you want to install Play, Cl Play Claw. This is where this becomes important. See, all these different options under the method of screen capture are available here. If you pick a method of screen capture that's inappropriate for your setup, it's just not going to work. However, I'm going to jump over to my screen. Oh, you know what? We're just going to make this yellow another one. So I'm going to say, okay, I don't have Play Claw installed, but if I did, I could click this. And you'll notice from my, my camera here, the lights went out. That's because I don't have Play Claw installed, so I can't utilize this option. I'm going to find this GDF FS arrow. And that one does kind of work. See, if I switch over to like Windows 8, it kind of works. And so you can figure out which one of these options works best for you. I'm going to jump over to my official screen capture option. See, I use this GDIFS arrow setup. And you'll notice that I selected this option. And using looking at the camera feed here, we can see that on the right side of the screen where it's purple, there's purple backlight. On the right side of the screen where there's red on the screen, I got red backlight. And then underneath it, I've got these different colors, uh, yellow, green, blue showing up. Underneath the method of screen capture is the delay, to, delay output to LED. This is how long you want of a delay between what's on the screen, what's screen captured, and what's sent, when it's sent to the actual LED. This can be useful uh, in some situations where they're out of sync, where they're out of sync, and you want to increase or decrease the delay. Underneath that is maximum frames per second. A couple things to keep in mind with this: it's maximum frames per second. It's not what it's always going to run at. You're giving it permission to run up to that number of frames per second, and essentially, it's saying how frequently do you approve of this software package checking the monitor to see if the colors have changed. Right underneath the maximum frame per second, we can see the capture speed. That is the actual rate in which it's moving right now. But if we were playing a movie with a lot of action or we were playing a video game that has a lot of movement on screen, that number will jump up to what we set. With a more powerful gaming PC, you may find that setting the maximum frames per second to 60 can eat anywhere between five to 10% of your CPU just for you running this software. If you lower that value, you can decrease the amount of CPU use, the amount of CPU utilization almost down to zero, but you're doing it at the expense of how frequently, how many times per second it's checking for updates. And if you get to a certain point, it'll be so low that it'll always feel like the program is lagging behind, that it's always a color that it was just a moment ago. So find that balance that works for you and your hardware. But before we can do any of that, it doesn't matter what we set these settings to until we actually tell the software where to, on the screen to look. So this is where we have to use the show areas of caption but, capture button. We'll click that and you'll see this outline on my monitor. And there's a couple of things that pop up when we do that. You have this reset to default, which resets it back to the computer's default, not the previous save settings. So just keep that in mind. There's the wizard capture zone, which we'll use in just a moment. It'll explain, that'll be how we actually set this up. But before we go there, I want to point out two things. One, the display zero. If you have multiple monitors uh, with multiple sets of these strips, I should say, uh, the display, you'll be able to configure multiple displays. So you could potentially have one monitor that's audio based and another that's screen based, or maybe you want multiple screens, but because you have a, you have multiple monitors, you need to calibrate them differently and separately. That's there. The other thing is you'll notice that these little boxes appeared. You see these little boxes here. If the box is really small, it may just look like a colored screen here. And your color may be different. The color of the box is really just designed to be different than your background of whatever's on your screen at the time. So it's easier to see these boxes. If you don't see a check mark in the upper left-hand corner, drag the corner so it gets bigger. And you'll see, oh, here's a checkbox. Here is the size of the box 
kind of in small print, and then here's the number. This number reflects the number in order from the start of your chord to that RGB light. So this is my 131th RGB light on the back of my monitor. In my case, I actually have 131, but I don't like the way it operates with 131, so I actually click this box and disable it. I bring this up now because in the process of trying to troubleshoot, if you ever run into an issue, come back here and look and see if any of your lights are checked off. Because some people have run into issues where they have everything set up, but the software actually thinks you want those, you want all your RGB lights disabled. So you can go in and make sure these are actually selected. Uh, the weird thing is, is that if this box is too small, the checkbox disappears. Um, but the color should should still be faded. It should still be kind of a grayish color if it's unchecked and lit up if it's if it is checked. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move that out of the way, put it down here. Okay, we're almost at the point where the the screen capture wizard is set up correctly. We just have to click on the wizard screen capture option, and then we have to fill out this set of information. A couple things that are important to my to remember. What direction is the lights on your particular setup going? Where is the very first RGB that's connected to the cord? Where is it located on your monitor? And if you remember at the very beginning of my thing, I said, hey, I recommend you start somewhere at the bottom of your monitor. It's just going to make your life easier in terms of getting this set up. So for me, I started my monitor just to the right of midline where my monitor stand would plug in. And it goes counterclockwise around my monitor. That's the, that's the order that I use. You could set it up however you want. But for me, because that's the way I set it up, I have to do a few things in my setup process. So the first thing I do is I click this no corners. That's because I opted to get the 90 degree angle adjustment tabs. And so I actually don't have any corner RGB lights. I just have the horizontal and vertical. So I click that. Then I have to change the direction. So I'm going to go up to this direction zones. Because my strips go from left to right, I need to change it from left to right. And if you do this on your screen, you're going to notice that the numbering swapped. So now the number one for mine is located all the way over on the start bar right where the Windows Start logo is in the bottom left hand corner. Then you have to decide how many sides do you have. So you may say, oh, you know, I only did three sides. I actually started in the lower right hand corner, went counterclockwise, and I only set up the left top and right. Or maybe you only set up the left bottom and right. Or maybe you set up all four sides but you have some overlap because of the way that you set it up. So you can pick which one of these makes sense based on the way you set up your lights, how much lights you have, the size of your monitor, and what you, you know, kind of where you went with that. So in my case, I have four sides. Now, the aspect ratio, this becomes important in terms of customizing how they're set up uh, in terms of uh, how high you want it and how kind of why do you want it? And we'll talk about that again in just a second. For th the next thing you want to do is count how many lights horizontally you have. And it doesn't really matter if you count horizontally, horizontally or vertically, but because it will automatically adjust the other component. For me, I have 19 RGB lights going up and down. So my vertical, I'm just going to drop down to 19. And I'm going to say, OK, so now there's 19 on the left side and 19 on the right. And all those extra RGBs out of my 131 are on the top and the bottom. So I've set my number of vertical ones. And then I need to offset where number one is started. So I'm going to keep clicking up. And this is moving the number one zone from the lower left hand corner towards the right. And I actually want to get to right about 
here. I'm gonna double check it. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. So right here is my zone. That's my zone one, and it's set up to be zone one there too. So at this point, I'm all set up. This is configured to hit the top, bottom, left, and right of my monitor, and the zones are all calibrated correctly. I can hit apply, close, and save settings, and it'll save it. But you may have noticed that the strip at the bottom includes the black taskbar. Maybe that's annoying to me. Maybe I use so many programs that keep that taskbar up. I don't want to include those. Or maybe I want to change the aspect ratio because I know that I'm going to be playing games that have black bars on the sides. Here's my ultra wide monitor, right? It's 34 inches wide. A lot of games that I play have black bars on the side or movies that I play because they don't fill up the ultra wide screen have black bars on the sides or maybe black bars on the tops and the bottom. And if these zones are in the black, the lights will be off because they're black. So I can use the aspect ratio section here to pick an appropriate aspect ratio. So let's say I take 1.44 by one and you see that it just changed how wide it is. It customized it. This is where customizing the zones for specific applications comes into play. I may load up a program that plays video, have it playing in the background, use my hotkey to switch over to Ambibox software, and then pick the appropriate aspect ratio so that it is appropriate for the film that I'm watching. Then I could save the profile as, say, uh, screen capture 1.44 and then have a custom profile specifically for when I wear, when I use that content. I assign a hotkey to it. And then whenever I want to watch that particular type of content, I hit that hotkey and boom, it switches the lights over specifically for that content. Or maybe you want to have it set up to capture a particular part of the screen because you have a picture in picture set up. And in the lower right hand corner, you want to have it just customized to that. There, this is how you're gonna kind of customize the size of your box. Now, if there isn't an option for you, if you don't like these zones, and none of these quite work for what you want, you can always drag, you can always drag the zones and manually set them up and manually resize them. So it's tedious, it's absolutely true, doing that is tedious, but if one of these most common aspect ratios doesn't meet your needs, and there's a lot in here, and most of the really big ones are in here, you can still do it. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, you can change the size of the perimeter to make them narrower and wider using the correct size parameter. So if it's almost right, you can shrink it so that it's, it's narrower or wider on your screen to customize it that way. Or you can change the uh, overlapping zones. So that, two, so that there is a portion of each zone that counts towards two different lights. So in this case, if you increase overlapping, what you're basically saying is, uh, imagine you have three boxes. The middle box would account for a portion of the box to the left and a box a portion of the box to the right zone. For some people, they think that it gives it a better blend, especially if you have a lot of lights in a small area. So you have that option as well there. The bottom cutout is if you have a monitor where you put RGB strips on the bottom, but you have a small space because of a monitor stand, you can actually use the bottom cutout to tell it, hey, in the bottom center, 
there's going to be a portion with no lights because there's no lights there. And then you can make a gap that that's there. So, um, oh, and then horizontal lengthening of the zones, you can use these options in the upper corner to adjust how big. So if I want to capture more of the screen, I can do so using these options here. The bigger the, the zone is, the more color information it's averaging. I would recommend that you try and stay with as small as possible, but if the program you're using or the stuff you're watching doesn't seem to reflect what's on the screen, you can try increasing the size of the zone to collect more data about the colors that are there. So that's everything you need to know about setting up a custom screen colors for, for that. Uh, and that sets up all your your profiles and tells and it tells the program, are you screen capturing? Are you doing audio based? Are you doing a, a static light or are you cycling through lights? So at that point, you're good and set up. However, there's these three extra tabs on the top. And I did promise that I would tell you what they are. They're not nearly as important as this profile tab in terms of getting things set up, but they can do some stuff for you that are helpful. So I'll go over it real, real quick. The additional configuration of zones allows you to adjust the color capacity of it. So the general brightness, the saturation, the hue, uh, both in terms of each individual zone, as we see on the left side, and then the general brightness of the whole thing on the right side. If the number of RGB lights you have is too high for your power supply, you may run into an issue when there's white on your screen or if you set white as your color because RGB strips use all three lights, red, blue, and green together to simulate white. This is opposed to systems that use RGBW, where white is its own LED. I mention this because if your power supply isn't powerful enough, when white's on the screen, it may flicker. It may just, because you're lighting up three times as many RG, or you're lighting up three times as many lights with the same amount of power. So if you're finding yourself frustrated because the white isn't operating the way you expected or it's flickering and it's annoying, you can click for all zones and change your brightness here or you can change your general brightness. I can change my brightness and make this really, really bright or I can make it really, really dull. And when I have color on the screen, I can set this as high as I want. Even with my 131 RGB lights on my fairly small power supply, everything looks great. What I run into issues with is when I open up, say, an Explorer window, which is all white, or I open up Chrome and I get an entirely white website, and now all of a sudden, all 131 lights, or I guess I should say 130 since I turn one off, they're all demanding all three, red, green, blue, be on, so it triples my total power outage, or power requirement, and my little power supply it just struggles. And so the lights start flickering, they get dimmer, it just doesn't look good. So I've actually just gotten in the habit of keeping the general brightness lower. It's fine for me because the area behind my desk lights up sufficiently. If you really wanted to change it for a particular game, you could. But I mention this because it's a common problem that I see where the power supply that came with your setup just isn't sufficient for an all white setup, especially if you have extra RGB lights or you have more than what the manufacturer expected you to use. The next tab is automatic profiles. This is a great way to set up, uh, it's a great way to set up your lights so that when you jump to a particular application, it knows that you want dynamic lights as opposed to a static light. So for example, I use the new GOG Galaxy 2 beta software to launch all of my games. So I have Steam, I have the Uplay software, I have all my different games running through the GOG Galaxy. So I've told the Ambilight software, whenever GOG 
Galaxy 2 launches and becomes the active application, switch over to the screen capture mode. Likewise, because my particular setup with the extra lights has problems where it's all white, I have it set up so every time I jump over to Fire, File Explorer, it automatically switches to the blue static backlight. That way, I don't have to worry about the brightness that I have it set to at that particular moment, because when I switch over, it's gonna just switch, when I switch over to uh, the File Explorer, it's just gonna automatically switch all the lights to blue, so I don't have to deal with white and not having enough power for it. I do the same thing with uh, some other programs that I have. Um, I have Uplay set up specifically on its own because I've been playing a lot of Uplay games lately and I haven't even been using the GOG launcher, I just launch Uplay directly. Um, and then I have the VLC media player set up because if I'm gonna watch movies, I know that I'm gonna wanna have screen capture set up as opposed to a static light. So how does this work? The easiest way to do it is to just launch the program, then go down to this crosshair down here, grab it, and you can drag it. See how it turns into crosshairs and it follows it? I'm, I'm clicking and holding down. I click it and I drag it. Just drop it on the window of the program you want it'll automatically add it to the captured application, set the profile you want for that particular program, hit add, um, and it will save it. So then going forward, anytime you have that particular application as your front application, the one you're using, it will change the color of your lights to that particular one. Um, you can use these boxes at the bottom to throw something up on the screen that basically tells you that you've switched to a particular one. I don't particularly find it useful since generally I'm switching between either screen capture and a really bright blue. I know that I've changed programs because the backlight changes, uh, but you could have an on-screen display pop up and tell you, uh, especially if you are using different like aspect ratios and you're switching between different aspect ratios for different programs and stuff like that. Additional settings, these allow for web control and APIs over servers. I don't use any of those programs, but if you were to do so, you could enable or disable them as, as you need. Just remember, always click save settings when you're done setting something up or it will not remember that you made the changes and you'll think you made the changes, but you really didn't because you never told the program to remember them. That's probably the biggest thing that I see where people make all these sorts of customizations and then they don't save it. At that point, you never told it to do anything. Um, other than that, uh, if you've got questions, throw them in the comments. I do my absolute best to stay on top of it. Um, Sometimes I'm bad and I don't check on these videos very often and I come back to a bunch of comments, but I really appreciate the questions you guys ask because uh, I love this software too. I didn't make it. I didn't develop this software. I don't sell any of the hardware. Honestly, I just have so many friends that have used it that I wanted to make sure that they had a tool available for them to reference so they didn't have to call me. And I figured I'd throw it on YouTube so you guys could, anyone else that needed help with it would have it. I. Uh, Hopefully that answers questions that you guys have. Again, like I said, throw it in the comments if you don't. Um, and let me know if there's another program or something else that you guys want me to, to kind of go over or if you run into problems with this. If I can replicate the issue, I'll try and make a video to explain to people how to fix that particular issue. As always, thanks.